Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah, Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the Ammonites, shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Arawir to the neighborhood of Mineth, twenty cities, and as far as Abel Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said to her, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed Zephon, and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites, and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hands, and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim, because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said, No. They said to him, Then say, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we... We stand in awe of your glory and your wonder and your beauty and your truth. And we thank you for a moment we have now to open your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you have in your kindness chosen to reveal yourself to us. To speak truth about this world, truth about humanity, truth about our need for you. I ask, Lord God, that you would move now by the power of your Holy Spirit, help our minds to be engaged, our hearts to be open and ready, and give us eyes to see, to see you and the glory of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray, and all of God's people said with one super loud voice, amen, amen. Amen. How are we doing, City on a Hill? Good. Uh, Wonderful to be with you. If you're new or visiting, my name is Guy. I serve as the pastor here at City on a Hill, and you have joined us for part six in our sermon series in the book of Judges, a series we've called All Our Heroes Are Dead. 
Uh, We're going to be kicking off in Judges chapter 11, so if you have a Bible handy, would you please turn with me to Judges chapter 11, and as you're making your way there, uh, did anyone happen to see the news this week about the uh, young Australian guy who's been unofficially uh, appointed Young Australian of the Year? Uh, I think he's been called now, labeled the, the hero we deserve, and of course talking about Egg Boy. Uh, 17-year-old guy from Hampton uh, in Melbourne, I think his name is Will Connolly, uh, better known as Egg Boy, uh, shot to worldwide fame for his infamous egging of a Queensland Senator, Fraser Anning. And as you can see, he's just gone global. Uh, murals have gone up around laneways across Australia. There's T-shirts you can buy online. Uh, uh, big bands from across the world are offering him uh, free unlimited tickets to their concerts. Uh, one big band, uh, Wheatus, uh, called him Hero of the Earth. It's clever. Uh, fans suggested the band uh, re-record the song Teenage Dirtbag as Teenage Egg Boy. Ben Simmons, Australian guy, NBA All-Star, went out to, to play uh, basketball uh, with Egg Boy written on his shoes, and he top scored, so that's impressive. And there's now a GoFundMe page uh, uh, that's been set up for Egg Boy to help with any potential legal fees and, of course, to buy more eggs. Following in the line of Ned Kelly, Crocodile Dundee, Shane Warne. Australians have a particular soft spot uh, for the rebel, the outsider, the unexpected and the ordinary. Well, today uh, we're going to add to our list of anti-heroes with a look at Jephthah. Three scenes to capture his journey. Act one, a modern family. Act one, a modern family. The narrator sets the scene in verse one. Now, Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior but he was the son of a prostitute. Uh, It's a striking introduction. On one hand, he enters the stage with much promise. Jephthah in Hebrew literally means the Lord opens. And so here is a clue for us that perhaps this is the man that God is raising up to open a way of salvation for God's people. They're once more in a spiral of sin and destruction. There's this promise that, that through Jephthah, God might open up a way. In addition, we're told that he is the Gileadite. Now, now that's a region uh, in the land that God had promised to God's people, but it's also a tribe a well-revered tribe, a a noble and wealthy and prosperous tribe. And in addition, the narrator points out that he was a mighty warrior. He's a big man. He's a strong man. He's a man who's got a reputation for skill in battle. He can defend you. He can fight for you. He's a mighty warrior. Now, all of those characteristics and credentials, however, are placed in contrast with some a scandal, you could say, concerning his birth, right? He, Je- Jephthah was a Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Now, who is this mystery woman? We don't know. We're not, we're not told anything of her name, her, her place, or her people. And perhaps that's deliberate. Perhaps the scandal of this moment lies not so much in who she is or where she is from, but what this says about Jephthah's family and his father who had the affair. You see, in the ancient world, it was not uncommon for men to marry for utility while at the same time pursuing romantic interests outside of the home. And that was certainly true for the Canaanite people. The Canaanite religion were very promiscuous, uh, uh, like their gods. They indulged their pleasures and had temple prostitutes and, and, and pursued that with unfettered passion. And yet, Jephthah's father was not a Canaanite. He was an Israelite from the noble tribe of Gilead. And like all men of Israel, he was called to be a faithful man. He was called to be faithful to his bride, called to a lifelong covenant of love, honor, and commitment. And you say, why is that? Well, the obvious answer is that a lifelong commitment provides a certain security that enables the husband and the wife and the children to fly and flourish together. But among Israel, marriage is also about much, much 
more. You see, throughout the Bible, we discover that marriage is a good gift given to God's people to mirror the unique, binding, steadfast love and covenant that God has with His people. So just as God chose Israel to be His bride and vowed to be with her for better or worse, so the men of Israel were called to be set apart from the rest of the world and to image God in the sacrificial and steadfast love that they showed to their brides. And yet, for reasons not explained by the narrator, Jephthah's dad broke that sacred vow. And in many ways... In many ways, his unfaithfulness stands as a living testimony of Israel as a whole. Despite God's faithfulness, despite God's love, Israel continued to disregard their vow and continued to flirt around with other pagan gods. And as is the case with all sin... The sin of Jephthah's dad places Jephthah himself in a very precarious position. Have a look at verse 2. And Gilead's wife, Gilead being Jephthah's dad, Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out. And they said to him, you, you shall have no not have, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So it's important to feel the, the weight of this moment. Jephthah is not only the son of a prostitute, he has grown up as the object of scorn and, and mockery in his own home. And the rejection of his brothers reaches a, reaches a new low when they work out that that his place at the family table is going to cost them some of their own inheritance. And so fueled by insecurity, fueled by greed and a, and a thirst for power, they, they point Jephthah to the door and say, you're not welcome anymore. Now we need to appreciate, don't we, that in the ancient world, the, the family was everything. The family was was your identity. The family marked your meaning and your, your purpose. Your family not only gave you a narrative to understand your past, it was certainly the security in your future. Your family was everything. And so what does Jephthah do? Verse 3, Jephthah fled. He fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Now, as I was reflecting on this, I, I began to ask the question, well, well why does he run? Haven't we just been told that he's a mighty warrior? Could he not have just stood his ground or better yet, shown his brothers a lesson or two? I can't help but conclude that Jephthah ran because he loved his family and the pain of rejection and the constant harassment became too great. You know, it's one thing to be wounded by an arrow in war. It's something altogether different to be knifed by someone you love. And some of you know this firsthand. You know this from your own experience. Some of you here today grew up in homes where you didn't feel wanted. Maybe you were put on the outside by your brothers or sisters. Maybe your mother or father mistreated you. Maybe you woke up every day feeling that sense of sadness because you were just on the outside, always looking in, always feeling like you weren't wanted. It's a terrible and sad feeling, and it's only natural for a person to want to run and to get out of that, to say, I don't want to be, have any part of that. The narrator tells us that the Jephthah, you know, he, he got up and, and, and he left. You've got to picture that moment. You see him, you know, shoving some clothes into his bag and maybe a, a few personal items as he kind of wipes his tears from his face and moves out the front door and goes up that dirt road away and away and away from his home. You can almost see, can't you, the, the brothers standing on the front porch with that smug indignation, sending him off on his ways. You can also see, can't you, the, the mother perhaps perhaps washing some dishes 
looking through the front window, seeing her son go, and, and she knows it's not right. She knows that this is unfair, and yet she's too... Well, she, doesn't, she just wants to keep the peace. She doesn't say anything. And then you ask, well, where is the dad in all of this? What's the father doing? Shouldn't he be the one who races down the dirt track after him? Shouldn't he be the one who goes to him and says, Hey, son, I'm sorry about this, but, but I love you. I care for you, and I want to make this right. Please come home. But instead, he's just absent. Instead, the father is silent, indifferent, sad. It's, it, it's, it's, it's terrible. And it's sad not only for Jephthah and his family, but what this says about the family of God. They were set apart to know and enjoy the blessing of God, the favor of God, the inheritance of God. Set apart to live a life of color and love and peace. And yet when you zoom on into this family and get to the table, oh, you see a people that are consumed by lust, insecurity, greed, fear, and division. Jephthah, he runs. And he runs and he runs and he runs. And, and the narrator says that he lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. I, I'm not entirely sure what a following among worthless fellows is supposed to mean. Uh, is it a special gathering of state politicians? Collingwood supporters. Church pastors, perhaps. We can't be sure. Uh, but I think what this is telling us is that Jephthah uh, found a following among outlaws and outcasts. And this leads to Act 2, rebel with a cause. Verse 4, the narrator says, After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader that we might fight against the Ammonites. Now, by way of background, the Ammonites were a big, menacing, dominating army. And in fact, we read in Judges chapter 10 that they had oppressed Israel. They were dominating Israel for 18 years. And their dominance kind of escalated to a new height when they encamped themselves in Gilead. Right? So the stakes are kind of ramping up. Israel are getting squashed out. Their hope of su survival is diminishing because here are the Ammonites in their very land ready to lay siege on them. And so the Bible tells us, the narrator tells us that the elders of Gilead, along with all of Israel, huddled together. And they huddled together in this place called Mitzvah. And, and, and they huddled together and they decide or they talk about uh, uh, which man from among them is going to rise up and take on the Ammonites. Which Leader will go to the front lines and battle for us and defend us and, and fight for us. And they agree amongst themselves, these elders of Gilead, that, that whoever this, this person is, uh, they will be made the head over all the inhabitants over Israel. And so they huddle together and yet not one of them is prepared to put up their hand. Right? The, the elders of Gilead, they don't raise their hand. The people of Israel are all pretty much like their head is kind of, their eyes are on the dirt. They're hoping desperately that no one touches them on the shoulder and nominates them. Right? Because the Ammonites are huge. They're, they're menacing. And then, apparently, one of the elders says, hang on. I remember a guy, a big guy, a mighty warrior, six foot five. You know, huge arms, used to be at a bench, two camels with one arm. What was his name again? Jephthah. Jephthah, yeah, that's right, huge dude. And then, apparently, I'm paraphrasing at this point, one of the young women comes forward and says, Hey, morons, you remember Jephthah? You were the idiots who sent him out of our tribe. You were the ones who kicked him out, right? The elders huddle again together. They think about what to do. They come before their people and say, ladies and gentlemen, we have chosen a new leader to go into battle for us. His name is Jephthah. And off they scurry. 
the land of Tob, to, to, to try and get him back. And, and you can't help but see the, the awkwardness of this scene. Like, here are these religious leaders, religious leaders, tribe of Gilead, and, and they're stumbling on into a club in Tob. And look, I don't know, it seems shady at best. People are drunk and lying on the floor. There's women selling stuff. Like, it's a shady kind of scene. And here's Jephthah, you know, at the bar, having a cigarette, smoke, uh, drinking a glass of whiskey. And in come these elders through the door, right? Probably a little bit overdressed. And they come to him, right? And he, he's like, and then they're pleading, oh, Jephthah, the great mighty warrior, the one we've always loved, the one we've always cared about. We need you. Would you come back and fight for us? Jephthah puts down his drink, puts out his cigarette, probably on one of the elders, and says, hey, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now that you're in distress? How many of you know that experience? How many of you have been in that position where someone has kind of mocked you, ridiculed you, ignored you, kicked you out, and then in a moment of need, they come knocking on your door, pleading for you to come back? What's significant to me about this exchange with Jephthah is it actually mirrors the troubled relationship that Israel had with God. You know, in times of prosperity and peace, they ignored God. They rejected God. They forgot God. They showed Him the door. And yet, in times of need, when oppression was upon them, they called out to God for help. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be, our, will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and the leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mitzvah. Um, I must confess that there is much that I love and like and admire about Jephthah. You know, he's had a very troubled, broken childhood, a very difficult life. He's had to kind of fend for himself. And I think we'd all agree that there's some legitimacy to him wanting to say, you know what, you guys work it out yourselves. You showed me the door, I'll show you the door. He could have done that, he doesn't do that. He goes with them, he accepts the invitation, he becomes the head, and he returns home. If you cast your eyes to verse 12, chapter 11, you'll see Jephthah doesn't immediately go to war. Uh, he actually seeks to kind of... Uh, seek a peaceful resolution. He sends message to the king. What do you have against me that you have attacked my country? The king of the Ammonites answered, when Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land. And what follows in uh, Judges chapter 11, I encourage you to read this week, is really a, a lengthy speech by Jephthah, kind of pleading a case for why they are in the right and the Ammonites are in the wrong. And it's multifaceted. I mean, on one level, he, he puts forward a historical argument explaining that, that, that Israel won the battle fair and square and his historical argument then becomes a theological argument because they won the battle. That's a sign that God gave it to us. So it's rightfully us, ours, in the sight of the Lord. So it's a theological argument. Then there's somewhat of a legal argument. Since the Moabites didn't challenge Israel's right to have the land and the former generations of the Ammonites didn't complain, then there should be no reason why we need to fight about this now. Their response... Verse 28, the king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. You know how people say the pen is mightier than the sword? Apparently, they're wrong. And so Jephthah arms himself up and goes to war. And that leads to Act 3, the father's tears. Verse 29, look with me there. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mitzvah of Gilead. And from Mitzvah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. 
Now, please note, uh, Jephthah was, as we've been told, a mighty warrior, a strong man, skillful in battle. And yet, the narrator points out that his real strength came from the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Just as the Spirit empowered Moses and Joshua, just as the Spirit empowered Ehud and Deborah, so that same Spirit is empowering Jephthah for battle. The Spirit that is living and active, the Spirit that is powerful to save. And it's an optimistic sign. We we read this moment with great anticipation. We read this moment with, with great, great hope. And yet, look what happens next. Verse 30. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you, look, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. And I'll offer it up as a, as a burnt offering. Now, some have thought that Jephthah had in mind at this point an animal. Right? He, he assumed that, the, the, that when he got home, an, an animal of some description, I don't know, a dog, hopefully a cat, comes out <laughs> through the door and greets him with some milk and cookies. And he says, Lord, I'll give whatever that is as a burnt offering. The problem with that is that in the ancient world, animals were almost always kept outside. And in addition, as opposed to a, if it was a human Uh, If an animal, as opposed to a human, was in view, then it's likely that the Hebrew would be a little bit different at this point. It would have been expressed in a different way. And of course, if Jephthah had promised God an animal, then if a person had have come through the door, which we'll come to in a bit, that if a human had have come through, then he would have considered that that promise would have had no binding impact, no binding force. And so it does seem clear then that when he vowed to God, when he bargained with God, he very much had a person in mind, perhaps a servant, perhaps one of the slaves in the home, someone he, the leader of all Israel, could offer to God for God's favor, for God's hand of blessing, for God's victory in war. You say, well, that's, that's terrible. That is a horrendous thing to, to make, to pray, to vow to God. And it is. It certainly is. But in many ways, he is just mirroring the culture of his day. Uh, We need to appreciate, and we've talked about this throughout this series, that the pagan religion of the Canaanites, which really kind of saturated the the land that God's people are in, uh, the Canaanites taught that the gods above, and there were many gods to them, the gods above had to be bought. You had to buy their blessing. You had to buy their favor. And so if you wanted to, if you're struggling to put food on your table, or, or, or let's suppose you, you had a romantic interest and you wanted love, you wanted to secure someone's love, or let's just say there was a threat of an enemy, you needed security from that, or let's just say you were going to war and you wanted strength for battle, you would go to one of the gods that kind of represented that particular offering and you would present to that god in advance a sacrifice of some form. Now, of course, depending on the size of the The favor that you were trying to secure should determine then the size of the offering. And so it's tragic, yet understandable to us, why historians point out that the Canaanites were known for offering children in sacrifice to their gods. Because they were so desperate to buy their God's favor, so desperate to buy that blessing that they would do horrendous things like put forward their sons or put forward their daughters before their wicked and corrupt gods. And so what does that tell us then about Jephthah? What does his vow, his sacrifice, this promise of a burnt offering, what does that tell us? Well, tragically, it tells us that even though he was the judge for Israel, he was deeply, deeply corrupted by the culture of his day, deeply influenced, a culture that not only held a very inadequate view of humanity, 
but a very, very sad and distorted view of God himself. Instead of seeing God as loving, loving and generous and full of grace, they reduce God to a distant, cold tyrant that had to be bought. Now, I do appreciate that the historical context of Judges is quite distinct from the context that we are in today, but I actually think this same lie that God is not good and that God needs to be bought, that same lie that circled around in those days is still very much alive today and still continues to surface in and outside of the church. Like, we believe God is mighty, oh, we believe God is strong, and we do, you know, most Australians believe that, you know, if God was on your side, He could give you some pretty cool things and make some pretty cool things happen. But most people assume that He needs to be bought, that we need to put something on the table first. You know, it brings to mind that great famous quote from Salieri in the play Amadeus. Uh, Salieri makes a bargain with God. Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself. Oh, make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. After I die, let people speak my name forever with love for what I wrote. And in return, I'll give you my chastity, my industry, my deepest humility every hour of my life. And I will help my fellow man. Salieri then lives the life under that vow. He keeps his hands off women. He works diligently at his music. He tirelessly serves and helps the poor, and his career goes well, believing that God is keeping his end of the bargain. Until one day, he meets Mozart, a vulgar, self-indulgent rebel who's clearly, abundantly gifted by God. And looking at his profound giftedness, Salieri says, Here I was, denying all my natural lust in order to deserve God's gifts, and there was Mozart indulging his in all directions. Later in the play, you see him, don't you? Looking at the crucifix, looking at him. And he looks at the crucifix and he says, from now on, we are enemies, you and I. And he takes that crucifix and he burns it. You see what was going on? Like Jephthah, Salieri had the appearance of someone who believed in God, the appearance of a religious, righteous man, but in reality was trying to use God. He tried to buy off God, to give God his every effort in exchange for the favor and fortune of fame and talent and admiration. But when God didn't meet his demands, he got angry and he walked away. City on a hill, uh, our God is not a God to be bargained with. He is not in need of your sacrifices. He is not holding out for you to earn, to buy, to purchase His acceptance and approval. Our God is a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of love. Do you know that? Do you stand in awe of that? Amazing, and yet not surprisingly, God's power continues to be with Jephthah despite his foolishness and unwarranted bow. Verse 32, have a look there. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Aurora to the neighborhood of Minith, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Karimim, with a great blow, so that the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Do you see what happened? Jephthah defeats the Ammonites and arises as Israel's new hero. And you would expect at this point that the narrator would then focus on in 
And we'd see scenes of celebration and champagne as Israel celebrates their new peace, their new victory. But interestingly, the narrator is quick to move from the triumph of this victory to the tragedy of Jephthah's arrival home. Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mitzvah, and behold, in other words, take note, look and see, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low and you've become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. As a father, I find this a vivid and painful scene. You can see him. Riding home, chest out, waving the flag of victory. He's got dirt in his hands, sweat on his forehead, blood on his face. And he wants nothing more than to celebrate this victory and with those he loves. Kind of reminds me a little bit of coming home after a long day in the office. Uh, Church ministry is not quite like fighting the Ammonites comes close some days. And, and the closer I get home, the more my heart begins to beat with excitement. You know, I, I take the Lilydale line out, um, and I get off at, at Surrey Hills Station. I walk down the underground, and I come on up. It's, it's all uphill towards home, and, and I kind of walk through the street, and then I walk uh, through an, an oval, and the last kind of like 50, 70 meters is, is, is a dark kind of laneway, but I, it's right next to my home, and so as I'm walking through the, the laneway, I can already hear the raucous of my kids and chaos inside. And I walk around and I open up the, the, the front gate and I walk on in and now I'm really excited, I'm really anticipating the, the arrival home and I get to the front porch and, and I ring the doorbell. Now I already have a key to my own home so I could just open it and go on in. But I ring the doorbell because as a dad there's nothing that I enjoy perhaps more than hearing the sound of my kids run and come to the door. The sound, daddy's home, daddy's home, daddy's home. And they scurry towards the door. And now the first person who gets to my door is my youngest daughter, Lily. And she's about this high. And I can just hear these little soft feet running towards the door. And I can see her cute little chubby arm reaching up. And she's worked out how to turn the snib and to open the door. And then she opens it up and she does like this little jig like this. And then she just launches at me with this almighty hug. And my heart is melted. And I feel that, and I love that, and it's why I find this moment in Judges to be so, so painful, so tragic. Here is Jephthah, after all he has been through in his life, after all that he had accomplished in his battle, fighting this war, fighting this battle, coming home, and he's, he's waving the flag of victory and triumph. He's, he's ready to celebrate this, and as he walks on there, he sees the door open, and to his shock and horror, he sees his only child, a young girl, walk on through. And it's in that moment that he remembers his most stupid and terrible and painful vow. It's in that moment that he senses the, the horror of what has just taken place and the fate that now marks his daughter. And so in verse 39, with grief and anguish, it says that Jephthah did with her according to his vow that he had made. Now that is, confronting is an understatement. And, 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 and to be fair, uh, some scholars have, have tried to argue that, 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 well, maybe Jephthah didn't kill his daughter, uh, but instead um, you know, offered her to God in a, in a devotion, in, in like a perpetual virginity. That she be set apart for that as a, as a perpetual virgin for the rest of her life. That's what was in view there. And, and I can see that you could make a case for that. 
You'll have to be the judge when you read the text. I can see you can make a case for that, but most commentators are not convinced. Uh, The most natural reading of the text is that Jephthah did, in fact, offer his daughter as a burnt offering. For a start, when Jephthah made the vow, uh, he didn't know that the person coming out of the door would be a virgin. Not only that, um, his daughter's request request for a two-month reprieve before the sentence seems to suggest that death was in view. And furthermore, as you heard in the Bible reading, at the end of the chapter... The daughters of Israel, the daughters of Israel went out year by year, year after year, to hold a four-day festival of lament, weeping, anguish, tears of lament. It's hard to imagine that kind of public outcry if his daughter had simply been dedicated to the Lord. It seems that something far more tragic has taken place. You say, so how are we to read Jephthah's sacrifice? Are we, are we to do with this? Was God pleased with this vow? Was God pleased with the sacrifice he made? And the answer is clearly absolutely not. This is a wicked and heinous, heinous act of uh, cruelty. And I believe that's the point. What was supposed to be a victorious moment of celebration, what should have been a season of peace for Israel, has gone up in flames because of one man's decision to yet again do what was right in his own eyes. You see, despite how strong he was, despite how far he had come, in the end, Jephthah, like the people of Israel, came back to that same place of rebellion, that same place of brokenness, that same downward spiral of sin, selfishness, and self-destruction. In fact, as you read, as you heard, I should say, in the closing parts of our reading, the violence against his daughter is repeated when he faces the men of uh, Ephraim, right? The men of Ephraim are upset that Jephthah didn't invite them to join in the battle that he went on to won. And he explains to them, he says, hey, guys, I did call out for you and you guys didn't come. But instead of meeting them with grace, instead of talking it through and offering peace, instead of inviting them to be part of the celebration and victory, what does he do? He has all 42,000 men killed, cold, calculated, killed, done. And these aren't men from a different enemy tribe, these are a tribe of Israel, 42,000 men killed, and Jephthah didn't care. His life began in pain and heartache, the son of a prostitute, rejected by his brothers, forgotten by his mom, abandoned by his dad. Tragically, it is in heartache and pain that his story ends. It's been said before, if you never heal from what hurt you, you'll bleed on people that didn't cut you. If you never heal from what hurt you, you'll bleed on people who didn't cut you. Hurt people hurt people. They hurt those around them. They hurt those they care about. And in the end, they hurt themselves. Over the summer break, uh, I was listening to a, um, a great podcast called Ear Hustle. And uh, it's, it's a great um, podcast that really gives you a good insight into humanity and the, the pains and struggles of our world. It's a podcast that interviews inmates at San Quentin Prison, hosted by two people, uh, a visual artist who volunteers in the prison and an inmate who's spending life behind bars. And in each episode, uh, they interview men who are, who are trying to navigate life and understand life behind bars. And, and really, you know, uh, it's, a sad, it's a sad picture. You know, these men have done some terrible, terrible things, murder and violence and burglary and rape. I mean, really horrendous things. And 
You, you, you kind of get up close and cur- uh, personal with them to hear their story, hear what life is like for them in prison, hear a bit about what they did, but also hear about what led to where they are today. And, and, and these guys, I mean, almost all of them take full responsibility for what they did. Almost all of them are you know, really saddened by the pain that they cause. But for me as a listener, the thing that really stood out to me was just hearing the constant narrative of family rejection, growing up with a difficult, broken childhood, hearing about a life where drug abuse, sexual abuse was the norm, and just seeing how that narrative continued to to form and to shape and to lead these guys to where they were today. It's not that they're diminishing responsibility, but there was something in that for me as a listener. Uh, One of the guys that they interviewed, such a tragic, sad story, one of the guys who's currently in prison today, right now, is a guy named Curtis, and uh, he's in prison, I think, for 50 more years. And uh, they got to know him and uh, hear about what he did, and, and, and you just hear the pain. Uh, he, he grew up in a difficult home, uh, a, a family of domestic abuse and, and sexual abuse. Uh, when he was uh, in high school, uh, his parents eventually divorced. Uh, his mother uh, left in that moment, ran away, and then a few months after that, his dad decided to leave as well. And so here he was as a young kid, trying to work out life without a mum, without a dad, and without a home. He says he ended up kind of moving from home to home, living on um, you know, uh, couches and, and in cousins and, and trying to find friends and a place to live. And this was always with him, this ache, this, this sense of rejection. And, and when he becomes 18, he decides that he really wants to reach out to his parents and to reconcile and to let them know that he cares for them. Um, he says, I, I wanted to let, he's talking about his dad here, I wanted to let him know I, I don't hold anything against you. And he says, I remember opening his office door and the expression on his face was not good. He was not welcoming or inviting. He actually told me he was remarried, had a son, they were moving away, and you were not welcome. And so he goes to try and find his mum. And through a relative, he's able to find her and able to seek her out. And he sets up this meeting in, in, in an apartment. And he goes in. He says, I remember walking inside and seeing her sitting on the couch. Even though I was physically 18 years of age, inside I was a five-year-old boy desperate for my mum's approval and not receiving anything. I don't remember no hug. I don't remember no I love you. I remember clearly her saying, Curtis, you're living in the past. And Curtis says, it was like a switch went off. I went from being this perfect Curtis to this Curtis who said, I don't care anymore. I am yet, I am yet to meet a person who hasn't been wounded by life in some way. Our scars vary in size, vary in depth, but no one gets through our world unscathed. And that not only hurts us, it shapes us. We start seeing ourselves doing things that we never wanted to do. We act in ways we we never wanted to see. Why? Because we too are stuck in that same cycle of sin. The sins of a father become the sins of the son. The brokenness of one generation becomes the brokenness of the next. The hurt, the chaos, the rebellion of those who went before us is the same hurt, chaos, and rebellion that plagues us today. What do you do with that? What hope is there for Jephthah? What hope is there for us? We need more than understanding. You and I, we need rescue. We need rescue from our pain. We need rescue from those who sinned against us, those who hurt us. We need rescue from the hurt we have inflicted upon others. We need rescue from the endless cycle of selfishness, self-destruction, sin, and death. As the band comes up, let me say this. Centuries after Jephthah, amidst Israel's ongoing struggle, ongoing cycle, we read of another man, 
another mighty warrior, another judge. And like Jephthah, this judge knew what it was like to be rejected, born in scandal, rejected by those he came to love. He came to his own people, and his own people did not welcome him. He became an outcast among outlaws. And yet, wounded by this world, this judge did not respond in anger, but pushed back the darkness with light. Instead of violence, this judge pursued peace. Instead of rebellion, he walked in righteousness. Instead of living in fear, he surrendered and trusted God and walked in love. And it is that love, that great love that he had for his father, that great love that he had for this world, the great love that he has for you here today that compelled him to enter into the brokenness and the pain and the sin and death that belong to us. And he descended down, taking it upon himself, that in him, that in him we might be free. Do you know what this means? It means that when you look at the cross, when you see Jesus Christ, you not only see the depth of our depravity and selfishness and pain and hurt, you see the height, the wonder, the openness of God's love. In John chapter 3, Jesus Christ, the true and perfect judge, says this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. You see, in the story of Jephthah, we have a guilty man who gave over his own and innocent daughter to save his skin. In Jesus, we have the true and perfect judge who in love laid down his own life to save the daughter of God, the church. I love the words of this old hymn. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he full of atonement. Can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was He to die. It is finished, was His cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Will you run to Jesus this hour? Will you run to Jesus with your own sin and the sin of those who've been committed against you? Will you run to Jesus with the the hurt and pain of your past and even the uncertainty of your future? Will you run to Jesus knowing that Jesus is good, knowing that in Him there is acceptance, knowing that in Jesus there is rescue, knowing that in Jesus we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are born again to a new life, a new and beautiful life with a new identity a new future, a new and high calling, a new and living hope. Let's go to him now. Would you stand with me? Our Lord, now God, we thank you for the glory of the gospel, the wonder of Jesus that broke into the pain of this world, the sadness and sorrow of this world. May we see Jesus see his love, and may we now see ourselves secure in him by faith, running to him, bringing every part of our lives to him. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the new life we have in him. And help us to celebrate your name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.